Good evening, everyone. The annual meeting of the Wings Club Foundation is now called to order. I'm pleased to welcome everyone here this evening. I'm Barry Eccleston. I'm president of the Wings Club Foundation, or at least for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, but I would like to start by saying uh, what an honor it has been for me to serve as the president of your club for this past year. Um, it's been a very successful year, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But I do want to make some introductions and also some thanks to various people who are here tonight. I'd like to introduce some of the individuals who have worked on the board uh, who are here tonight. So I'm going to call your name, and as I do, I would ask you to stand. I would ask the rest of us to hold our applause until uh, we've completed the roll call here. Um, Jim Allbell, are you here? I didn't see Jim. Uh, Sue Bear. Sue, are you here? Nope. Um, Bob Craft, our club council. Welcome, Bob. David Davenport, senior VP from Flight Safety International. Robin Hayes, president and CEO of JetBlue. Dawn Hickton, vice, president, vice chairman, president and CEO of RTI Metals. Uh, Jim Jacobs, president, JWJ. Welcome, Jim. Todd Kalman is here uh, from TK Advisory Services. <clears throat> Gary Krauthammer, president of Krauthammer & Associates. Uh, Kevin McAllister. Kevin, you here? Haven't seen Kevin. Um, John Pluger, President and CEO of Ellie's Corporation and your incoming president very shortly. Uh, Frank Prey. Is Frank here? Don't see Frank. Uh, Gary Spulak. I've seen Gary. Welcome, Gary. President of Embraer Aircraft Holdings. Doug Walker, Senior VP of SMBC Aviation Capital. Uh, so these are the board members who are here with us this evening. We're also recognizing, and I want to uh, thank past Wings Club presidents who continue to work with the Wings Club Foundation as President Emeritus. Please stand and be recognized. Uh, Bob Aronson, are you here? Bob is the retired director of the General Airports Council International. Dave Barger, retired CEO of JetBlue. Ken Gazzola, publisher Emeritus of Aviation Week, and president of Flight Logic. Stand up, Ken, you can't, can't get away with that. Uh, Carol Hallett of Council, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Jeff Nittle, President of CIT Transportation Finance. And Bruce Whitman, President and CEO of Fly Safety International. Welcome, Bruce. Um, all of these past presidents, all of these board members have been a tremendous support to me, but more importantly to your club through this past year. But we also need to recognize two or three other people who are here tonight, without which nothing at all would happen. So please recognize and thank the Wings Club staff for all their hard work. Tom Fitzsimmons, Tom at the back, uh, Lee McDougal and Pat Rowan at the back there. And please thank everybody. <laughs> it's been my privilege to be your president for the 72nd anniversary of the Wings Club. And I think it was a really spectacular year, and I, I hope you can agree. My year here has been very special to me, and, uh, and I like to think it's been good for the Wings Club. Um, and that movie just captures everything, I think, the success we've had throughout the past year. Um, at this point, I have to ask Tom Fitzsimmons if we have a quorum for this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mr. General Manager. So the chairs of the committees uh, of the board have prepared annual reports for each one of their activities, and these reports are now presented collectively as the annual report of the Wings Club Foundation. Copies are available here tonight at the registration table, and copies of the financial statements are included as well. We do need to vote to approve the annual report. So may I have a motion to approve the annual report, please? May I have a seconder? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Um, a word about the President's report on the year. In the annual report, there is also a short letter summarizing what I think are, have been the successes of the club. It truly has been a historic year, but first and foremost in that success uh, has been after many years of work, uh, the Wings Club Foundation has been merged with the scholarship uh, and we now have the legal formation of the Wings Club Foundation. Um, it's the, the merger that uh, Dave Barger referred to earlier on. Uh, a lot of people did a lot of hard work in that. We've thanked them before. We must thank them again. If you run into uh, our club general counsel, Bob Craft, 
Um, if you run into Dave Barger or Dave McKay, who may not be here, please thank them for the huge amount of work that they put in uh, to make this happen. And of course, Tom Fitzsimmons. Uh, this, puts us, this puts into place the structure that will ensure the success of our, of our long-standing mission to support the advancement of aviation. We will continue the scholarship fund's important work of encouraging aviation-focused collegiate level study. And we'll also continue to support charitable organizations that use aviation to help those in need. This past year, we also established the Wings Club Scholar Program. Uh, these scholarships, these new scholarships, are in addition to our traditional awards. Two very deserving students were awarded a full year of tuition scholarship. One student from Embry-Riddle and one from Vaughan College. Our vision is to continue and grow this program in the years to come. The success of these programs will be dependent on the successful growth of the Wings Club Foundation Endowment. To help us with this effort, uh, I'm very, very pleased to announce tonight that Harvey Cohen has joined the Wings Club Foundation as our Director of Development. Harvey, please stand, I know you're here tonight. Harvey has a four-decade career. I didn't want to say how old you are, Harvey, but you've had a four-decade career um, actually in development. And before coming to the Wings Club, he served as Chief Development Officer with AOPA, uh, so he knows aviation. Uh, Harvey, welcome to the Wings Club. And to the rest of you, Harvey will be around all this evening if you happen to have a checkbook and you want to write a little note, a little check. Um, you can give it to Harvey and please donate to our foundation. And of course, I want to thank one more time uh, our very good friend and colleague David Barger for his extremely generous uh, donation as announced at the, uh, at the October Gala. Thank you, David. <laughs> During the year, we continued and expanded our aerospace on campus program uh, in partnership with Aviation Week. Wings Club executives go out and speak at universities to student and to faculty regarding careers in aviation. During the last year, the program has included the University of Pittsburgh, NYU, University of Central Florida, University of Virginia, and in the UK, Loughborough University, where I myself uh, had the pleasure of speaking to the students just last week. So it's been a real privilege and an honor for me to be the Wings Club president. We hope this past year's achievements and accomplishments continue to serve the Wings Club Foundation well for many years to come. At this point, we need to move to nominations for the upcoming board. Uh, John Pluger, please join me at the podium to give the report of the Governance Committee. I'd like to deliver to you tonight formally the report of the Governance Committee. The following current members of the Board of Governors have been nominated to serve a three-year term. We thank them for their past three years and especially for their continued interest um, in serving on the Wings Club um, uh, uh, board. Um, and those are Brian Bedford, Ray Connor, Sharon DeVivo, myself, John Pluger, Bob Redding, and Doug Walker. The following are the new nominations for a three-year term on the Board of Governors. Uh, their bio information is available at the reception table. And it actually, some of you are here tonight, a few of them have just accepted as recently as last week, so they weren't here tonight, but those of you that are here, I'd like you to stand and be recognized as our new board members, starting with Ron Bauer, Vice President of Fleet United Airlines. Then we have Elise Eberwein, Executive Vice President of American Airlines, Elise is not able to be here tonight. Abdul Mulberry, President and Chief Executive Officer of GA Telesis. I don't think Abdul is here tonight. Uh, and Howard Rubel, Managing Director of Equity Research at Jeffries LLC. I know Howard is here tonight. Thank you all for agreeing to serve. Uh, and continuing to serve on the board as a past president and nominated for a one-year term, Barry Eccleston, President and CEO of Airbus North America. At this time, I'd like to ask, are there any nominations from the floor? There being no nominations from the floor, I'll now close the nominations. May I have a motion to elect these candidates for the board? Um, second? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and welcome on board our new board members. Um, 
we talked a little bit about uh, how we are trying to encourage the upcoming generation through our university programs, but at the other end of the scale, we have a number of uh, people who have been in this club uh, for many years. And some years ago, we instituted a program called the Golden Eagles. Uh, the Golden Eagles are, is a way to honor those who have given so much to aviation and specifically to the Wings Club. Uh, and to recognize these uh, people in, an on in the honorary group, uh, we came up with a couple of rules. Uh, if you're a guy, if you're a man, you have to have a combined age and membership of the club in years of 120 years for a man, and the same would be 95 years for a woman. Uh, this is not discrimination, it's simply that women were not in the club in the early days, so we were trying to allocate for that. Um, and this year we have seven, seven Golden Eagles, seven one of our Wings Club members have made that criteria. Um, and I'm going to read out their names, and then a couple of them are actually here tonight, so I'm going to give them their awards. Uh, the, the seven Golden Eagles for this year are James Burke, elected to the club in 1974, G. Wayne Hawke, 1981, Glenn Hickerson, 1971, William Moxley, 1988, George Tompkins, 1977, Carol Hallett, 1996, and Patricia Johnson from 1980. And we're very fortunate to have Carol Hallett and Bill Moxley with us tonight. I invite them up to the podium for the presentation of their Golden Eagle pins and certificates. It's a very special privilege for me to, uh, to appreciate some of the senior members of our industry and people who have given so much to uh, the industry and specifically to the club. The others were not able to be with us tonight and their certificates and the Golden Eagle pin, pins will be mailed to them. Um, if there are any other previous Golden Eagles in attendance tonight, could you please stand and be recognized? Okay. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Ken Gazzola, Chairman of the Historical and Education Committee of the Board of Governors and past President of the Wings Club to present this year's Outstanding Aviator Award. Ken. Thank you, Barry. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, before I begin, I want to say something to John Pfluger. Uh, you got one hell of a challenge with the annual dinner this upcoming year. <laughs> We've never had, it was like central casting. And Barry, you did an extraordinary job this year and uh, each year we get better, so the challenge is yours. And we also counted John's gray hairs tonight so that a year from now we can take measurement. <laughs> so, on a serious note and why we're here tonight, tonight the Wings Club in partnership with the International Aviation Women's Association is honored to present our sixth annual Outstanding Aviator Award. We created this award to recognize exceptional aviators whose actions have made major contributions to aviation and who serve as leadership role models for all of us. Our sixth honoree will join a stellar roster of aviators previously recognized with this award. Those of you who have been here with us for a number of years for this award, the first were the Tuskegee Airmen, and they were here, several of them, with their family, 50 strong. The women Air Force service pilots, the WASPs, the Doolittle Raiders, Tom Griffin was here, Patty Wagstaff, and last year, Bob Hoover. That's quite a group. Tonight, the Wings Club is proud to present our Outstanding Aviator Award to an extraordinary civil aviation pilot. The timing of this award could not be better since Captain Darcy Henneman just retired from an extraordinary career of 40, 41 years at the Boeing Company. And since we are all family here tonight at the Wings Club, I'm gonna call her 
Susanna from now on. Susanna. Captain, Susanna. Susanna has led approximately 500 instructor pilots globally, 500, and has been responsible for all pilots providing flight services and all instructor pilots providing flight and cabin safety training. She also had oversight of flight training operations in flight services campuses worldwide. Susanna joined the Boeing Company in 1974 and started her career in engineering. Most recently, she was chief pilot of the Boeing 777, most responsible for engineering flight test activities related to the seven, 777, all 777 models. She's been an integral member of the team of the 777 program since its inception, contributing to the design, the testing, certification of this extraordinary airplane, as well as the derivatives and added features and technologies. She became rated as a captain of the Boeing 747-400 in 1989 and later achieved campus captain, uh, captain status as a, as a rated captain on the Boeing, listen to this, 747, 737, 757, and 767. Doesn't get much better than that. And the first woman pilot, test pilot, employed by Boeing in both production and experimental test. She's been in her current role since 2008. On November 10th, 2005, Captain Darcy Henneman commanded a 22 hour and 42 minute flight. Makes me wonder about all the 15 hour flights we've spent and 22 is extraordinary. On a 777-200LR that set a record for the longest nonstop flight of a passenger airline, airliner. She and a, and a team of pilots flew 11,664 miles, nautical miles, eastward from Hong Kong to London, crossing two oceans and a continent. Susanna is a member of the Society of, no surprise, Society of Experimental Test Pilots and a frequent guest speaker at industry and community forums, including the Royal Aeronautical Society Seattle branch, we have to get you to Washington soon, where I'm chairman. Uh, the GE Accident Reduction Operations Team and the NASA Goddard Engineering Colloquium. In 2010, Captain Darcy Henneman was inducted into the Women in Aviation's International Pioneer Hall of Fame. She is a graduate of the University of Washington with a Bachelor of Science degree in aeronautics and astronautics engineering. Captain, you've come a long way. Please now watch the video and see her amazing accomplishments. It was quite simply the flight of a lifetime. You can go your whole career as a pilot and never have something like that happen. It was November 9th, 2005. Captain Susanna Darcy Henneman and a team of pilots were attempting to fly the newest Boeing 777 into the record books with the longest non-stop flight. While the 777-200LR was designed to fly farther than any other commercial airplane, the path to the world record was not easy. Flying east from Hong Kong to London meant crossing two vast oceans and a continent. The team needed a few factors to work in their favor. If the winds went away, we might not make the record. If the airplane had a mechanical in flight, we wouldn't be able to make the record. So we spent months of planning, everybody working probably 16 plus hours a day, because for a record flight, the devil is really in the details. After taking off from Hong Kong, Captain Darcy Henneman commanded the 777-200LR out over the Pacific. For the next 23 hours, she and the team of pilots took turns flying. We had a whole schedule of when you flew, when the meals were, when your sleep period was. Meanwhile, the 777-200LR settled into the winds and just kept flying. The airplane was perfect. She was perfect. The airplane had been a little persnickety upon occasion during flight testing, but um, it was like she knew what she was supposed to do. One of the great things was we did have two sunrises and they were both gorgeous. Probably 
about eight hours into the flight, it hit everybody on the airplane that we would smash the existing record really big time. But this was still an experimental airplane flying a challenging route. So the pilots said they couldn't take anything for granted. They focused until the end when the airplane finally arrived in London with fuel to spare. And typical of going into London Heathrow, we have to hold. And the controller is saying, I'm really sorry, you have to hold. And we were all laughing. So we landed uh, in Heathrow, and they rolled out the fire trucks and did the water greeting. And then we parked at the Queen's parking spot. So that was pretty good. Uh, joining me for the award presentation tonight is Milan Skolnik. Managing Director of Lenoma LLC and a board member of the International Aviation Women's Association. She's also joined by her fellow board members and two very talented young people who are here tonight. Mylene, uh, you're here. Yes. You, thank you, Milan. He always has a hard time. Um, thank you, Ken. It's always a great pleasure for us at Iowa to be back at our uh, joint uh, award ceremony, and uh, we would like to thank you. We would like to thank the Wings and all of our Iowa members who are here tonight. Um, as with our other affiliations, with ISTAT, with ICAO, with ACI, IATA, um, our affiliation with the Wings Club allows us to continue our work uh, to promote uh, the advancement of women in the aviation and the aerospace industry. Um, we owe the selection of Captain Susanna to two of our Iowa board members and Boeing executive Chris Felrath and Sally Bondi. Last year at our Seattle conference, which was our best conference ever, of course, um, they invited Captain Susanna to speak to us. And in front of 300 mesmerized women, she told us all of her stories under the title um, Test pilots do not wear pearls, and she's wearing them tonight, but she would maybe t tell you the story about the turbulences and the pearls going up and down. So we're very happy that uh, Susanna is our recipient uh, for this award uh, after the WASP and after uh, Patty Wagstaff. This is our third time to select. I would like to call up to the podium uh, our board members, uh, Chris Ferraz, Sally Bondi, um, Abby Breed, who is uh, with United and who is our IWAS president, Andrea Brantner, who is with GCAS and our VP sponsorship, Ellen Slow, who is, uh, and Susan Bear, but I don't think she's here. She's here, Susan Bear, who everybody knows, she's also on the Wings board. And we have our two scholarship recipients from Vaughan College. Uh, Ka Kathy Guerrero, are you where? I don't. Kathy, can you come up? And uh, Anaid as well. Anaid is also um, uh, our scholarship recipient from, uh, and she's also actually the Wings recipient from your October dinner. So we share uh, with you similar goals in terms of education and legacy. And we would like to call Susanna. Please join us. We're busy here. <laughs> and. Um, I mean, as someone once told me, once you open the gates for these women, it never Sorry. closes. <laughs> Susanna, if you don't want to come up, and uh, I guess Ken and I will... You will read the citation. Thank you. I will read the citation, which says, um, The Wings Club and Iowa Outstanding Award presented to Captain Susanna uh, Darcy Henneman for her outstanding achievements, uh, which serve as a role model for aviators, March 25th, 2015. Thank you. Well, I am still stunned that I won this award, so good evening and thank you so much. And I'd like to thank Iowa and the Wings Club for such a lovely honor, especially as they mentioned coming right on the heels of retiring February 2nd, and for those of you who don't remember, that would have been Groundhog's Day. So I've been retired for about six weeks, and as I said, I'm deeply honored and, and really deeply touched. 
Um, I had no idea when I made a career choice of uh, becoming a pilot, which I did at three years old. I told my grandmother when an airplane went by, that's what I was going to do, uh, that it would really change my life from the people I've met, the fabulous airplanes I've flown, and the places that I've been. But you can imagine being born in the 50s, because Ken has sort of given away my age, which at this point is out of the bag, is that the uh, path from three to where I stand today wasn't exactly a straight line. And like all pilots, I did some crazy things to build my flying time. One was I made fried chicken, which I couldn't do today if my life depended on it. Uh, chocolate chip cookies. I still can make a chocolate, mean chocolate chip cookie. A friend of mine, I went because I went to a college that was primarily men originally in California, taught me how to cook so I could find a husband. And uh, then she got really cranky with me, didn't speak to me for three months because I traded fried chicken and chocolate chip cookies for my first flying time. But that did get me started. Um, I also, uh, any guy I went out with that had a car, I, when I was in high school, I talked them out to driving uh, to the brand new airport in Sacramento. Um, it took me a while to figure out why they were really disappointed when we watched the brand, brand new Pan Am 747s take off and land because you had to go out this old levee road was the only way originally to get there, so what's a boy to think? But, you know, I was such a nerd and I was so focused. It was all about the airplanes and all about the flying. Uh, but one of the things that was really fortunate for me growing up as a child in the 50s was my, my grandparents, my great uncle, and my godmother, who were real goal setters and who believed that if you were willing to set your goals and pursue them with a single mind of purpose, you could do anything. And it didn't matter whether no one had ever done it before or your gender had never done it before. That was merely a detail. So when I told my grandmother I was going to become a pilot, uh, that part of my family just thought it was fait accompli and, you know, I needed really to get a get a move on. But I think a lot of us, um, myself I will say, small decisions that I've made have had really large repercussions like deciding to move to Seattle over a 35 cent cup of coffee. Uh, I moved there uh, with my husband and um, I wouldn't have gone any other way. I wouldn't have ended up working for the Boeing company. Um, I started off in engineering, as Ken said, worked through, I actually worked in training the department I eventually ran, who knew? And then, because I wanted to become a pilot, and a friend of mine had gotten a job with United Airlines, the airlines had finally started hiring again, I set a one-year goal that by November 1st of 1985 I'd have a flying job, or I'd take it as a sign from the universe that I really wasn't meant to fly and I'd move on. Now I have no idea what I was going to move on to, but I was being very reasonable. And on October 31st, through an uh, interesting series of circumstances, uh, at uh, 11.30, so 12 and a half hours to go, my timing is kind of spot on, a little tight sometimes, I was offered the job as a test pilot for the Boeing company and the first woman to, to be offered that job, so that is how I started in flight test. I'll say flight test is a fabulous organization, but you work out on a flight line, any flight line, uh, everyone's fair, but it's tough, and if you're working on a flight test flight line, um, it is really tough. So the first year, uh, it wouldn't have mattered if I was a guy or girl. Everyone stands back to see what you're going to do. And one of the things I found distressing was when the mechanic uh, pulled out the headset and walked away when you, you know, told them disconnect, and they'd signal you out of your parking stall, because we drove out of the stalls, um, to all the guys, they'd say, uh, have a safe flight and a nice day. And with me, they just unplugged the headset and walked away. Now, what I knew was that the first year of being a woman, the first woman in a job, because this was the third, third job that had happened, that you just had to suck it up and, and work your way through it, and it would be okay. And sure enough, about uh, the end of the first year, uh, the mechanic, when I said, you can go ahead and disconnect, we'll see you in two hours, said, yes, ma'am, have a nice day, saluted and walked away. Now, the air traffic controllers also would tell everyone to have a nice day, except for one person, that would have been me, um, because there were really, I, I don't believe at that time in Seattle, there were any women that were air traffic controllers. And that same day uh, that the mechanic told me to have a safe flight, uh, when they, I went to change frequencies, the air traffic controller said, have a nice day, sir. And he got really discombobulated, and he said, ma'am, no, 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 I mean, sir, no, I mean, ma'am, I mean, ma'am, sir, and he goes, uh, you know what I mean, have a nice day. 
Well, when you're in a flight deck with a bunch of guys, you gotta know what my nickname was for the next five years. Ma'am, sir, it was. <laughs> and then of course, you know, you've gotta have a great sense of humor. Uh, every pilot has made at least one faux pas on the radio, and here was mine. Around this same time, of course, it all happens together. Uh, we popped out of the clouds, you know, we, we do get a lot of rain in Seattle, and we were up in the sun and some guy behind us was having a bumpy ride, and so the controller asked for a TOPS report. And I said, oh, we popped out on top at 27,000 feet and it's really nice on top. And I see three guys, three guys in the flight deck all do this. And I'm thinking, what, what, you know? I'm just, I'm new, I'm doing my job. Um, and this voice from out in the ozone, it was, I'm sure it was the Alaska Air Group guys. <laughs> Sexiest male voice I have ever heard said, yes, I've always liked it on top myself. <laughs> and I started blushing from my ankles all the way up. And of course, before I got back to the office, everybody knew the story, but you've got to, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself. But I never did it again. So I think uh, Ken said I have to tell this story tonight. Um, I am wearing my pearls. I very rarely pull them out uh, when I was new. Always, it all happens in the first year. It's like, please, God, let me get through the first year. So I went out to do stalls one day, and the guy I worked for sent me out to learn anything because the facts are I had 680 hours when I was hired. I had all my licenses, uh, but, and I had no jet time. So the company really took... Um, an opportunity on a very passionate young woman who wanted to fly. So the guy sent me out to, uh, he said, you're going to do stalls today with one of our most experienced captains, and here's your job. You just keep him out of trouble. That's all you do, keep him out of trouble, talk on the radio, raise the gear, the flaps. It sounded so easy. Uh, at the time, because I was the first woman, I didn't know what to wear to work, so, you know, the guys were, in those days, they wore ties, so I had this fake set of pearls from Nordstrom's, $7 in 1985. And off to the airplane we went, and I didn't know Jet Stall Buffett. That's the data I was really missing. So off we went, and if I hadn't been so nervous and so green, I would have noticed that the captain had his five-point harness cutting into his skin. And mine were loose, so I can get to the gear and the flaps and run the radio and keep the guy out of trouble, because that was my assignment. So we start in the first stall, and he doesn't know that I've never done this. Somewhere there was a, a kind of a communication gap. And so, you know, I'm, I think, oh, this is really interesting, because the galley is right behind the first officer in a 6-7, and I hear a little metal clinking of the inserts, and, oh, okay, it's bouncing around a little bit back there. And we're moving a little bit more, we're moving a little bit more, and then we get right before the stall break, and we hit the really heavy part of Stall Buffett, where the flight instruments actually kind of, you can't even see them. It's like they almost compress and come back again in your eyesight. And uh, I hit my resonant frequency. So I'm bouncing out of my seat probably about this much. My very fashionable do, which was much bigger in those days because it was very, that was what you did. Um, I'm bouncing so hard my hair is sticking in the circuit breaker panels. Uh, the pearls, the beads, are beating me in the face. Um, I, of course, what do you do when you're the new kid? You look at your boss, the captain. Does he see what a fool he's got in the other seat? No, he's concentrating. Okay, we're good there. And the air traffic controller is calling me, so I'm trying to tighten down my belt, stuff down the pearls, talk to the controller, and look like nothing at all has happened. I was mortified. So I go back into the office, and the guy who eventually became our chief pilot, John Cashman, said to me, well, he, he'd say this jokingly, well, little girl, what did you learn today? And I said, well, today I learned test pilots don't wear pearls. And I've always said if I write an autobiography, that by default would have to be, be the title of it. I, I never wore jewelry in the flight deck after that. That was, that was it. I took the pearls, the beads, back to Nordstrom's and called it good. Um, I saw Ken uh, had the pictures of the world record flight, for which I totally appreciate. We actually talked our marketing department into doing this flight. Uh, 
we had worked on talking the marketing department into spending millions of dollars uh, for quite a while, and it was a big risk for them. But some friends of ours had set the world record in, you have to do it in category and class, so weight class above 661,000 pounds. And they had held the record for, at that point in time, 16 years. And we thought we had the airplane to break it. And so the marketing department, um, you, you know, the pilots can be a little pesky to a marketing department. I know all you guys over here, yes, you're all going, yeah, the pilots, just get back in the flight deck, leave the marketing department alone. Uh, they put the money out uh, for us to take this fabulous airplane from Hong Kong to London the long way. We did not go the wrong way. Uh, we went the long way because uh, the, of the tailwinds in November would be 6% of our distance. We had to break the record by 2%. Uh, we ended up breaking it by almost 22%. We were shocked, uh, delighted, and this is our 10th year we've held the record, and our goal is to hold it longer than the guys did before. But if you'd been in Hong Kong with us that night, um, around our goal is to take off at 10.30. We had Richard Quest on board. In fact, he was in the flight deck with us, and he's watching his watch. I'm saying, no problem, Richard. We'll be out of here at 10.30. But I look out the window, and as you know, Hong Kong's incredibly busy, and there are airplanes everywhere, and I'm sick at heart because a team of 70 people has poured their hearts and souls into this for months on end, 16 plus hours a day. Anne had come to Hong Kong beforehand to do all the last of the arrangements, and they'd been up since seven or eight o'clock that morning working. So I thought, well, Susanna, you've done everything you could do, and you just have to trust that it's all going to work. It was a great life's lesson for me, because there's nothing else to do. You've done everything you can do. And about 10:15, uh, the air traffic controller calls and says, uh, will you give me a 10-minute heads up when you want to start your engine? So we did the math backwards and called her back and said, you know, we want to start our engines. And she said, you're cleared to start both engines, which is like, really? And I look up and there was nobody moving on the airport. They had stopped all of the traffic. And we started the first engine, and they cleared us to taxi. We started the taxi, they cleared us for takeoff, and we rotated exactly at 10.30 at night, and then after that, it really seemed like the flight could do no wrong. It was pretty magic. So you saw when we arrived, we got to park in the Queen's parking spot. Um, we're still pretty proud of that. There was no queen, but that was okay. Uh, it was also um, uh, Guinness World Records Day. Uh, we also won an award for that, and we proudly say we're the only people there that don't have 21 children or two heads, but that was a good thing. Uh, but the last part of the anecdote is that when I moved out of flight test and took the job in training, of course you have a brand new team, you call them all together for an offsite, and one of our guys came from Australia, and he started talking about the world record flight from the 16 years before in the 4-7 that went from London to Sydney. And I thought, oh, there's the other guy. I knew one guy, there's the other guy. And so he's talking about how great it was, and then he says, having no idea who I was, um, except for his new boss, and then some cheeky bugger in a 777 took away my record. And everybody got real quiet, and they all looked at me, and Ray's going, what, what? I thought, oh, what do I say to him? Um, so I turned to him and said, well, Ray, you know, I'm the cheeky bugger. <laughs> and my goal was, before I retired, to have him forgive me, and it, it didn't happen. His feelings are still hurt that somebody took away his record. But, but if it had to be somebody, it was OK, it was me. So I'd like to finish my remarks this evening with an ask from all of you. Um, you know, when you win something like this, you really think back on your career. And test pilots are very sentimental. Don't tell anybody, so if I well up a little bit, forgive me. Um, I stand here tonight uh, because of a lot of people, but one person in particular, Captain Brian Weigel, who is the vice president of all of the pilots uh, when I was hired, who was willing to take a risk. And for that, I will always be deeply appreciative because who in their right mind would hire the first woman, and she has no jet time, and she has 680 hours of flying time. Okay, she has an engineering degree, she has a reputation for being tough and focused, but who would take that risk? But what I think he saw was my passion. So I would ask all of you, we're all here tonight because of somebody who did that. And for all of us to be that person to somebody else. So 25 years from tonight, 
you're sitting in the audience with the person that you have mentored or sponsored, and they're standing here. Thank you very much again for this fabulous work. Thank you. Thank you. Before we complete, uh, those students in the audience tonight, I heard, hope you learned something about taking risks and goal setting. Susanna, what an extraordinary story. Thank you. And to top it off, I want you to know that as a result of re receiving this award tonight, you become a lifetime honorary member of the Wings Club, which began in 1942, a little before both of us. <laughs> that concludes our program. Thank you. I'd like to call Mr. Jeff Nittle, uh, Chairman of the Nomination Committee, to the podium. Thank you, Barry. And I have the great honor, uh, again, to announce the Distinguished Achievement Award for the Wings Club. Now, for those of you who have not been to the event and not seen some of the great honorees that we've had, they look a lot like Dave Barger. They look a lot like Jim Albaugh. These are people that have passion, that care, and have made a difference in this industry. And generally speaking, this is about aviation, this is about aeronautics, and this is about excellence. And together, they, we end up with great people like this. Now tonight, our 2015 award winner is John Leahy from Airbus. Now, for those of you who don't know John, let me give you a little bit of background. He's currently the chief uh, operating officer for customers for Airbus. Some of his accomplishments He's known as the Trillion Dollar Man for selling a trillion dollars of airplanes. I believe that's, he's the first and only person to have done that. In terms of how he started, he started right here in New York. He started as a taxi driver in New York. Now he was probably the one beeping the horn, trying to get people out of his way to go forward. Because not many things stopped John. And what he was able to do over the course of his 30-year career at Airbus, and really the last 20 years as um, chief salesman, is take their market share from 17% to 50%, and to triple the number of customers. So John has earned the honor, and I look forward in October, October 23rd, and seeing you all there to honor John. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Congratulations to John. And, and Jeff, thanks as always for the fine work you do with the uh, committee every year. Um, now, at this point, I'm going to invite members to stay for the next part of our meeting, which is actually the board meeting, the annual meeting of the Board of Governors. Uh, so at this point, I need to formally declare the annual general meeting of the Wings Club Foundation closed and I declare the Board of Governors annual meeting open. So I now call to order the annual meeting of the Board of Governors. Uh, Tom, do we have a quorum? Thank you very much. Uh, the Governance Committee has proposed the following club officers as the slate for the 2015-2016 fiscal year. The nominations are John Pluger as President, Mary Ellen Jones as Vice President-Elect, Scott Donnelly, uh, correction, Vice President and President-Elect, Mary Ellen, Scott Donnelly as Vice President, Dave Davenport as Secretary, Todd Kalman as Treasurer, Bob Kraft continues as our Council. May I have a motion to elect these candidates as presented? A seconder? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We now have a new officer team. Congratulations to the new officers. And it's now my great pleasure to invite my friend and colleague, John Pluger, the new Wings Club Foundation president, to join me on the podium.
Oh, you're still working. <laughs> yeah, I'm still okay. working. All right. Um, John, please accept this engraved uh, gavel as recognition of your new role at the Foundation's leader. I wish you luck and, of course, offer my continued support. And I now turn the meeting over to you. Thank you so much, Barry. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Now it's you. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, uh, Barry. Um, I just can't tell you how honored I am to become your 73rd president of the Wings Club, and I pledge to you my best to do everything possible uh, to continue to raise this club, its stature and its eminence. But I'd like to first start off by acknowledging and thanking Barry Eccleston for his efforts and leadership during his year as president. And as an actual expression of the foundation's appreciation, we're presenting to Barry the Wings Club President's Chair. Do we have a picture of that? There we go. This has become a tradition for the Wings Club. The chair has actually already been sent to Barry's home. Uh, it's a bit impractical to deliver it right here and now. So that's a photo of the chair. But we have one other thing as well. And uh, Barry, if I could just get you to come up one more time. We have a plaque which I would like to read to you. Presented to Barry Eccleston in grateful appreciation of your dedicated service as president, 2014 to 2015, the Wings Club, New York City, March 25th, 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> now, it's through the hard work of Barry and my other predecessors, many of you here tonight, uh, that the foundation is actually in a very, very solid position, and I hope to build uh, on this success. You know, this is typically where the president of the Wings Club announces their initiatives for the year, so I'm going to give you mine. I actually have two. I'm going to follow it with a third in action right now. The first is that I've taken a look at the history of the Wings Club, and with Tom's help, I've actually read the original charter. And that original charter specifically said that the Wings Club was formed to have a place and a forum for aviation issues and matters. I think that's fantastic. But I think it's something we've not really focused on a whole lot in the past couple of years. We have great lunches. Sometimes issues are presented, sometimes they're not. But I think we can do more. So my first major initiative for this club is to emphasize the role of the Wings Club in the airing of issues and matters concerning aerospace, defense, aviation, airlines. And I'm happy to say that we're doing that by asking all of our speakers from here forward to specifically address an issue, a matter, that they feel passionate about, that they feel needs airing. We're going to present to you some great speakers to do that this upcoming year. And dovetailed with that, I want to thank a former president, Mr. Barger, over here for a great idea. We've really not done this very much in the past, but in, conjun in conjunction with this initiative, we're going to open up the Wings Club to be a forum, not only a forum, but we're going to open it up for, for press conferences, for press releases, news forum, news releases. People might not take advantage of it, but actually having an independent venue site has some value. So we're going to dovetail that measure onto an initiative to have the Wings Club be utilized more for issues and forums pertaining to aviation. My second initiative is one we've already started as a club, but has tremendous power, actually as evidenced here tonight. We've started the Aerospace on Campus program. It's been tremendously successful. You saw some pictures here during the, uh, the video of that. And this is an area where the Wings Club can also do more. Its board members, its committee members, its officers can do more. It has had such tremendous power and we've had such great feedback, not only from the universities involved, from the speakers who provided these, these site lectures, but from the students. 
And you know, most of what we do, a lot of what we do, is about the students. Tonight we have some here. I think they came here on their own. There's a group from York College here tonight. Where are you guys? Are you sitting over there somewhere? Where Are you still here? Come on, stand up. These folks came in from York College. I had a great discussion with a number of them this evening. I want to thank them for coming this evening. And thank you for your interest in the Wigs Club. We think you're going to find value here. You are a future. Thank you very much. Vaughn's College. I know we have a few students here remaining, or a scholarship recipient from Vaughn's College. Are you here tonight still, or did you leave? Can you stand up again and be recognized? And the third thing I'm going to do to kick off my presidency is to make a slight change. As organizations of this have progressed, and as the Wings Club has risen, I think not only in stature, but in what it contributes, the actual workings of the Wings Club, its leadership, has also risen. So in that context tonight, I'm going to ask Tom Fitzsimmons, our general manager, to order some new business cards, because I think his title from tonight forward is going to be executive director. Tom? At this point, we're coming to the uh, end of our program. I don't believe there's any old business. Is there any old business co to come before uh, from the board members for this board meeting? Having none, we'll move on to our new business. And that is we are going to announce and request the board approval of our committee chairs for 2014. And although some of you have been recognized um, this evening, I'd like you to stand up anyway when I call your name if you're here this evening. Uh, I'm very happy that many of these committee chairs are continuing on, but there are some new ones. So starting off with the awards committee, Jeff, would you please stand? Development, we have Dave Barger, uh, Dave McKay. I don't think Dave is here tonight. European committee, Marlon Daly is not able to be here tonight. We do have an executive committee. It's chaired by myself as the president. Uh, we do have here tonight Todd Coleman, who is the um, finance chairman. And Todd also serves a dual role as treasurer for the club. Governance uh, is now um, Mary Ellen Jones, who is actually the vice president and, and, um, and president-elect for the Wings Club. Mary Ellen is unfortunately stuck in Australia. She's not able to be here tonight. And quite capably, and the one and only guy who really can do this job in this chair, Ken Gazzola, for the Historical Education Society. Ken, you want to stand up? Yeah. Membership committee, uh, co-chaired by Gary Spulak and Doug Walker. Are you guys here tonight? Doug, Gary, thank you. <laughs> Taking another leadership role within the club at my specific request and has already done a great job, Mr. Dave Barger, program chair. <laughs> we have a new committee now that the Scholarship Foundation has been integrated into the Wings Club and we are now, in fact, the Wings Club Foundation. We now have a new uh, scholarship committee. And I've asked Abdul Mulberry, who is our newest board member, who was the head of the former Scholarship Foundation, to serve as the chairman of the Scholarship Committee this year in its transition year as it becomes fully part of the Wings Club. And then finally we have Dave Davenport as the club secretary. Dave, are you here? Thank you, Dave. So, from my fellow board members, may I have a motion to approve this slate? May I have a second? All in favor? All opposed? The committee chairs are approved. So I'd like to remind everyone about tomorrow's monthly luncheon and site lecture. Our featured speaker will be Bob Crandall, quite an outspoken individual and leader in this airline industry. I am sure it's going to be very interesting. We never know what Bob Crandall is going to say. But evidenced by the fact that we already have a so completely sold out luncheon, I'm sure it's going to be very interesting and entertaining. The next annual meeting will be held on Wednesday, March 30th, 2016. Please mark your calendars. And now I'd just like to invite everyone to stay here for an open house reception, which follows immediately after this adjournment. So from my fellow board members, may I have a motion to adjourn this board meeting? Second. We are adjourned. 
Thank you all very much.